Hello everyone, this is update for August 21, 2024, day 910 of the war and of the date update. Also catch up for August uh, 20, 19 and 18. Apologies for a little bit of a regular schedule, probably will be like this till mid-September. Uh, um, and then I'm planning to be a little bit better with schedule. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, general and... Um, uh, strategic updates and then we're going to switch to the situation on battlefield uh, on the battlefield in ukraine uh, so i'm going to start first with the us um, <clears throat> there is not that uh, not much of um, macroeconomic data but uh, there is important uh, data that came out from our bureau of uh, labor statistics in the us uh, and the importance of that is that it actually there was a negative re revision to the total number of um, uh, jobs that they that this uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, sort of counted, and uh, the <clears throat> the revision is negative, uh, and it's eight hundred eighteen thousand uh, jobs, as you can see. Uh, the the importance of this is sort of twofold. The first one is that, um, as we can see, the data is uh, that's provided by Bureau of Labor Statistics is extremely unreliable. This goes back to what I was saying before that I think uh, um, ADP employment data is much more reliable and data from uh, people who receive uh, unemployment benefits uh, also more reliable because it's actually um, uh, actual people who receive money uh, so it's it's obviously factual versus this one is more survey uh, and it's uh, um, prone to huge as we can see huge mistakes uh, so uh, and that's uh, it shows that it's a 0 0.5 uh, uh, percent uh, I think it's uh, relative to the total uh, uh, employable population in the US which is I think roughly 160 million so it's a huge mistake as you can see and uh, the other importance of this uh, mistake is that it's uh, negative meaning that uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, overstated uh, over past uh, I think since uh, starting from March uh, 24 till March 2023 it overstated uh, job creation so the actual real situation uh, uh, in, term, in the labor market is actually worse and as you can imagine significantly worse because 800,000 jobs is is large number um, so again goes back to the idea that uh, US uh, job market may not be as um, not in, in great shape uh, uh, the other importance of um, uh, this data if we look at actually a table uh, where the statements uh, are coming from. So the first one is, uh, the biggest one is professional and business service. This is essentially your white collar jobs. They are highly paid. Uh, and this is sort of like a consumer driver of the economy. So this is an extremely bad sign that uh, this is, uh, this, this jobs, there's, that this is significant portion of that overstatement. Then financial activities, similar situation, white collar jobs, you can kind of put it in the same bucket. And then information, so again, the same idea. Uh, so, and then if you also look at manufacturing, there's also very, you know, there's, going goes back to the story, there's no manufacturing, any kind of renaissance. But if, and, the, and they also relatively, they blue collar jobs, but they relatively uh, decently paying. So. Um, between this uh, four categories, this is 600,000 jobs. Uh, so as you can see, majority of these revisions are in, uh, let's say, best jobs you can have. Uh, so it's not, uh, you know, some there are some revisions in low paying jobs such as leisure and hospitality, but if you look, majority of the negative uh, result is is coming from um, from the type of the jobs <clears throat> that bring um, 
obviously spending in the economy um, uh, generate more value in the economy value add and they also generate taxes so it's it's uh, from many perspectives this the revision is really extremely negative sign uh, overall uh, and then just gonna touch base we can see that um, US debt continues to grow it's already 35.2 trillion uh, now let's uh, switch to other country Japan uh, there is statistical data came out about export import uh, in Japan uh, as you can see uh, export grew at 10.3 percent which is uh, very good and consistent with uh, GDP growth uh, there uh, however the import grew actually much faster pace 16.6 percent uh, um, and this produced extremely negative trade balance for Japan which is essentially turning uh, Japanese business model and let's a look at the Japan as a uh, country as a business on its head because uh, Japan is export driven economy that's where value add is created there so what you need to have is what we observed in the prior period where export is larger than uh, input growth uh, <clears throat> so um so it's effectively you selling your product at the loss this negative trade balance that's what it really shows to us uh what this there's actually broader implications to this uh this also means that probably inflation in japan is going to be on the higher end and it also means that interest rate like japanese central bank interest rates are going to stay where they are which uh, they went up a little bit from zero and they may actually go even further high even though Japanese central bank stated that that's not going to happen but um, they they are sort of data driven they they follow the market they don't um, they don't lead the market so if <coughs> and the market by that I mean the, the whole economic situation so uh, if uh, there is a negative trade balance you will have to increase interest rates what well, this also means that uh, japan uh, will have to repatriate its investments from around the world and uh, in particular uh, us where the biggest uh, supplier of capital uh, to the us uh, so that supply uh, will you know go down and um, that will create obviously um, sort of domino effect where the interest rates in the US also will be supported at a higher level so uh, overall what this this really means is there is a, a developing shortage of the capital uh, that's uh, gonna be supporting high interest rates overall in the Western world uh, and <clears throat> so that's the essence of the situation now let's switch a little bit uh, closer to the to the war and this is going to be russia uh, so first uh, uh russian president visited uh, azerbaijan uh, this is the president of azerbaijan uh, for two days so that's quite unusual uh, typically this visits so just one day and and that's it so this really um probably implies developing uh, really strong relationships uh, relationship between the two countries and uh, both countries are uh, exporter of energy and specifically crude oil so there is not much um, of sort of uh, cooperation between the two countries in that respect uh, as they are effectively competitors on the world market mm, but uh, this is probably more related to uh, Russia's ability to trade with the world uh, using um, uh, Azerbaijan as a facade and uh, at this point uh, Azerbaijan is becoming Russia's um, effectively ally because they have conflict of effectively um, a low intensity war with uh, Armenia and Armenia is uh, allied with now with the West so this is 
sort of geopolitical alliance uh, that's being solidified effectively and obviously there will be economic benefits for russia which will allow russia to operate uh, through azerbaijan as i mentioned and it's also building connection with turkey because azerbaijan is somewhere is in some ways is a sister state of uh, turkey uh, then let's uh, switch to uh, another uh, busy uh, sort of schedule so on to busy schedule russian president and he uh, met with um uh, uh, chinese uh, 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 premier uh, of the state council uh, li uh, chang uh, who came to russia um, it's unclear what was the purpose of the visit however at the same time relation uh, i would say not relationship but um, economic situation is actually mm, between Russia and China uh, is becoming more difficult even though there is this political sort of support and things like that uh, so first uh, Russian um, business companies have really hard time uh, conducting business with uh, China um, even in uh, Chinese Yuan because uh, because Chinese banks are not willing to engage in um, the, the money transfer transactions between two. So effectively, uh, financial system to extend paralyzed. So they to the point that um, they seriously considering barter between the two countries. But uh, as we all know, barter is never essentially it never works. Uh, or I guess it works if you go to Stone Age. Um, so that's there are huge problems developing in that way uh, and then also Russia's um, crude oil export um, dropped by 7.4% uh, to China in July uh, which may or may not be related to this problem with um, um, uh, banking system or I'd say Chinese banking system where they don't want to take any risk due to the potential sanctions and obviously for china they earn more uh <coughs> doing business with the rest of the world versus russia so for them uh they they are extra cautious in, in this way um now let's switch to the situation on the battlefield in ukraine i'm gonna do it in a clockwise fashion the way i always do uh and we're gonna start with the kursk region of russia and see what's how things are developing there uh, so <clears throat> essentially i would say that ukrainian uh, advance has stalled and there is no any major movement uh, russian uh, troops are attempting to counter attack uh, but there is very clear russia does not have uh, resources or reserves uh, of let's say battle capable of units insufficient quantity to bring uh, to Kursk region which been known for a while but they brought couple of couple units um, 810s naval infantry brigade as they've shown 115s and uh, 15s it's unclear if it's brigade or division at this point so this is sufficient to contain to prevent a further Ukrainian advance at this point at least We'll see what happens if Ukrainian command decides to double down and throw more resources. So there may be some advances, uh, but uh, otherwise, so the Russia strategy is to contain this um, this advance with the minimum possible resources, uh, and the rest, the the, the front line is essentially uh, manned by uh, conscripts, which are low quality, much lower quality troops. Um, I would say I would say questionable uh, um, fighting capability but uh, this kind of like hodgepodge strategy actually is working and the other part of the strategy is that uh, simply Ukrainian forces need more troops as they um, control more territory so it naturally uh, prevents Ukrainian uh, troops from advancing further because uh, there is 
not enough troops to be to be advancing uh, to cover this this territory uh, the only uh, sort of uh, and and having said this so that i believe that we may have reached the point where um, this adventure into uh, kursk region has reached its peak and it's going to be on decline meaning uh, that the ukrainian forces may uh, start uh, uh, losing uh, territory that uh, they control uh, soon however there is sort of caveat and, and sort of um, something that's positive for ukraine uh, and that is that a Ukrainian um, forces managed to destroy bridges. These three bridges, last time I mentioned there were two destroyed, now th last one was destroyed. Uh, they are successfully blocking uh, establishment of pontoon bridges by Russian military. So uh, what this really means, this whole area essentially cut off uh, from Russian troops and um, whatever number of troops russian troops are here they essentially in um soft pocket i would say so the only way they can still escape is just basically swimming across the river which is possible the river is about like 30 meters wide um so you know you it's doable but you're obviously gonna lose all of the equipment and, and everything um so so this is it's very likely if possible that Ukrainian forces will manage to capture this territory that I show uh, all the way to Totkino. It's not going to change anything uh, from a big picture perspective, but uh, probably going to um, sort of be used for propaganda purposes of uh, that Ukrainian troops are advancing and uh, able to uh, capture territories again. Um, from big picture perspective completely means uh, nothing uh, except for maybe this encircled Russian troops if Ukrainian forces will prevent um, escape of the encircled Russian troops then uh, you obviously get uh, more prisoners of war uh, which would help Ukraine because right now it's extremely unfavorable situation Russian uh, military holds many more prisoners of war than ukrainian uh, does and so that creates um, disparity and inability to really uh, exchange uh, prisoners of war between uh, the two sides uh, now let's move uh, south let's see what's going on northeast of kharkiv uh, things here are uh, completely stalemate uh, not really meaningful changes. And by the way, this 155th, 155th, uh, 55th, yes, uh, Naval Infantry Brigade. So it looks like it's being split. So we probably have a couple battalions there, a uh, couple battalions here in this area. Uh, by there, I mean in the Kursk region. So it's not even complete unit and it's torn apart. Again, uh, probably showing the um, strain uh, on the Russia's uh, military resources at this point. Uh, now let's move to the North Slovakian section of the front line. Uh, things here did not change much. Uh, essentially, Russia's pressure towards Kupiansk, Russia's pressure in the south, south of the sector, but uh, no new major advances here. Um, and I apologize, I put 24, I meant 21. Uh, for the date, um, just a typo. Uh, now let's move uh, uh, south and let's see what's going on on the north uh, Donbass section of the front line. Uh, so Russian, I would say mild pressure continues around Sivers, but it's really, it's very clear it's not a major area of application of force for Russian, for Russian military, just uh, more pressure to keep tension uh, to prevent uh, withdrawal of any reserves uh, from this area uh, by Ukrainian command. Uh, then uh, Russia's attack uh, in the area of uh, Chesiv Yar essentially stalled. There are some minor uh, advances towards Rehorivka, this village, so basically Russian troops, Russian command is attempting to um, to expand their control on the eastern side of this water channel 
to enable to um, bypass just CVR from south and north, but still it's far from uh, from anywhere sort of being complete. But uh, so again, um, this probably attack in um, in Kursk region by Ukrainian uh, forces essentially uh, put to a stall this um, attacks on the secondary uh, secondary areas for Russian advance and this and this sort of was kind of like um, marginally secondary between basically hybrid between secondary and most important one but for now this turn this changed this this area into the secondary area uh, for Russian command uh, now let's move to the central Donbass section of the front line where really things are happening and where Russian command did not change anything uh, Russian um, attack uh, continues at full force full speed uh, as strong as possible uh, and there are results the front line is slowly but surely collapsing uh, for Ukrainian forces uh, the most notable development uh, since uh, last video is uh, in this area where I'm showing sort of southern uh, uh, flank of advance so essentially Russian command is ensuring that this uh, bottleneck is wide enough so there is no risk in terms of any flanking uh, attacks even though I, as I said before Ukraine forces are not capable of uh, conducting any um, true offensives but uh, Russian command still wants to be uh, super uh, sort of uh, sure that that's not going to happen. Uh, then uh, this uh, town of Ohrodivka is saying it's it's close to be lost. Probably very high chance that by next um, video it will be lost or will be almost lost. Uh, but Russian troops essentially started uh, engaging to fighting uh, for this uh, uh, small town. Um, this is sort of major. Uh, major changes here, but as you can see, the once Russian troops uh, uh, capture this Novohorodivka, this really opens the gate to further develop move in this direction, north of Selidova and then south of Pokrovsk, and and essentially then they can actually turn around to the west of Selidova. So uh, this really um, makes the situation basically gets from bad to worse with every every day let's put this way and once Russian uh, troops uh, capture this uh, this area Selidova, uh, Pokrovsk this is captured uh, partly by this black box uh, there is essentially no major obstacles all the way to Dnipro River uh, and if they reach Dnipro River it, the whole Front line, obviously, it's in complete collapse, and it will collapse the Parisian front line. It would be huge, major loss uh, for Ukraine. So it's, it's essentially strategic defeat. Uh, at that point, uh, as I mentioned, let's just look. Uh, this is all um, sort of prior pictures, as you can see. Uh, and let's just. Uh, um, and this is just a big picture of this whole development. Uh, but. Essentially, if uh, Russian troops manage to get to Dnipro here, uh, Ukraine is effectively losing Kharkiv region and Dnipro region and completely the Parisian region. So this is going to be essentially, at that point, it's complete strategic defeat, disaster, and um, also probably means that the rest of this, uh, of the part of Ukraine on the eastern side of Dnipro river might be... Um, uh, quickly captured uh, by Russian troops and I'm sure that they will try to establish bridgehead on the western side of Dnipro river and try to move to Mykolaiv Odessa in this direction as well um, so this potentially uh, may escalate this uh, this well I'm trying to say that this advance towards uh, Pokrovsk is um, extremely dangerous and uh, at some point, it will sort of uh, will turn into self-sustaining sort of negative reaction dominoes that will be 
sort of naturally following and un unstoppable in some ways uh, for Ukraine. Uh, this is the uh, next section of the front lines of Parisia, where just uh, basically perfunctory pressure is not much is happening here. And as I mentioned before, this is might be a donor uh, region uh, for or section of the front line for the Russian command for specifically for this attack towards Solidova Pokrovsk area and then. Um, to allow to contain Ukrainian troops in the Kursk region. Uh, now let's finish with the situation along the Dnipro River. Uh, and things here are quiet for um, obviously strategic regions, I mentioned before. Again, uh, this, this section of the front line is, we know definitely is a donor uh, for other sections of, sections of the front line uh, for Russian command. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Bye-bye.